Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of the Rugby Analysis Deep Dive with me, Geraint Davis. Over the next few episodes, I'm joined by players, coaches and analysts from all around the world. Each individual focuses on a specific aspect of the game. And today's guest, Stuart Edwards, who's the Scotland Under-18s Backs and Attack Coach, is going to focus on Playoff 9 in particular. We look at the backline, the forwards, attack and defence, and everything in between. The aim is to be analytical and not critical. If you enjoy what you see, please do hit the subscribe button below because it helps the channel grow. Let's get into it. Really pleased to welcome Stuart Edwards to the first episode of The Deep Dive. Stuart, how are we getting on? Very well, mate. How are you? Yeah, we're very well, thank you. Enjoying the bit of sunshine for a change. Um, so, just, Stuart, if you want to just introduce yourself and give a little bit of context to yourself before we get started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I, I work up at... Stuart's Melville College in Edinburgh, um, the head of rugby up there, um, still playing at Heriot's Rugby Club in the Super 6, uh, and luckily enough to coach the Scotland under-18s um, back to an attack. So very lucky to still have that um, connection between playing and coaching and how that feels and being you know, on both ends of the spectrum. Um, I'd like to think keeps me connected to the emotional side of the game. And uh, yeah, it's been great to meet you over the, over the last few months during lockdown. It's been one of the big positives, so thanks for having me on. No, no, pleasure. It's been, um, I think, one of the, the benefits of lockdown is that we've been able to have really good discussions with lots of different people, and uh, we've definitely had some very good ones last, last few weeks. So uh, let's get straight into it, uh, get into some of the detail. Go on. Okay, so the way that this works, just for everybody watching, Stewart's picked out a number of clips. We're going to have a look at the detail behind in particular, some of the playoff nine. Uh, I've then got some clips, and then we'll try and dig down into as much of the details as we possibly can. Uh, and then if you've got any thoughts or any questions, please do chuck them into the comments, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, so Stuart, you've got your first clip up. Uh, this is Bristol against Harlequins uh, from earlier on. Um, so if you want to give us a little bit of context on it, and then t- uh, take us through your thoughts on it. Yeah, a couple of things that I noticed here, um, you know, Really interesting setup from Bristol. It's different to what you're seeing traditionally within teams t- tacking off nine at the moment. Um, really like the connection between I think it's Lua Tua and Shidi. Um, Shidi staying connected to Lua Tua throughout the whole movement. You know, as Lua Tua moves forward, he goes with him. And although he doesn't get the ball at the back, his presence there is allowing that contact that comes subsequently to be faster than it would be. He was carrying on his own. Um, but obviously, the the next bit that I like from that is the, the outside runner coming at real hard down line um, to create that two layered approach that, that will really stress defences. Um, and you see there, if the ball had gone out the back, the Harlequins defender is shot out. I'd, I'd back Shidi to take take that space and mm-hmm. potentially get his hands free uh, and allow him to play from deep. Yeah, I'm a massive fan of these kind of plays. I mean, we. we... We don't see a huge amount of variety of of uh, playoff nine of of ruck in particular. Um, I think Bristol are one of the teams that do this best. So I, I love the, I love that stack uh, setup. They've got the extra numbers, and as you say, she, you know, Shidi is connected all the way through. And he, he's even then got an extra option off it, which uh, is is pretty hard to defend. Uh, and while they've they've gone tight on this occasion, they've as they've still created a disconnect. I mean, there's still a, there's still a break in the line uh, where they could quite possibly have, have broken through. So. It's a yeah, yeah, nice bit of variety to the play. Yeah, I think we'll see that as we, as we go through these clips. You know, the, the importance of that presence of the, the back connecting to the forward in front of them uh, and the impact of that. You'll see that in this one here. You, you see, uh, I think it's Marcus Smith um, losing his connection to the forwards and actually pointing to the forwards to carry the ball. Uh, so for me as a defender, that's giving me the cue that a ball is not going out the back. Okay, that means I can narrow my decision-making options. I can go hard at the attackers. Can focus on the tackle, can focus on the ball, and then subsequently slow the ball down for the next phase. Um, I think that, although a very small detail, if, if, if Marcus Smith could move with the forwards here at the same time, mm-hmm. he's at least painting a picture that he may be getting the ball and it may just put an extra bit of doubt in the defenders' minds. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the, the connection of the Bristol line right now, they've got pretty good line integrity right now. They've got uh, well, 14 players up in their feet and uh, the majority of them are in the front line. I mean, they, they, the outside are clearly not, they're not interested, are they? They're not being bought. And then even off it, you look outside of that, of that shape, there's no, there's no movement outside. So trying to draw Bristol players ahead of the line, 
is, is not is not broken them at all. So when it comes to then wanting to, to be able to defend next phase, they're so quickly back in the position and able to, and even though there's a little bit of driving contact, they're still able to get into position pretty quickly. So yeah, as you say, a little bit of animation um, and indeed outside getting them uh, them animated as well could have a big difference to that defence. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, you know impact just with that softer shoulder or a, or a softer contact to you know, take off half a second of the contact speed might be could be crucial in the in the next phase or the next phases ahead of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then as, as you're as you're alluding to this uh, this next clip you picked out uh, essentially addresses quite a few of those issues. So just, just talk us through what you're seeing. Yeah, so slightly more connected. I'd probably still argue that Marcus Smith's maybe a bit too far far away from the from the uh, the forward in front of them, but much more animated around actually painting a different pitch for a defence. You see here their, their numbers up, they're then creating a 4v2, um, 4v3 with a linger shut in the gate. Um, but just by having that connection between the forward and Marcus Smith allows them to create a situation. Um, mm -hmm. Could be argued that if he went hand-to-hand -hand here and, and you know pulled in that second-last defender, he might have created a, a 3v2 on the edge as a linger closed. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's it's easy to sit sit here and look at that um, in hindsight. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's easy to look back and say, you know, should have done that, should have done this. We're not we're not feeling what he's feeling. We're not seeing what he's seeing. So, you know, at this point here, if he t attacks that space, if he's a little bit flatter for me, and he attacks that space in between the second and third last defender, he may then be able to go hand to hand, mm -hmm. which may then create a four v three with the winger closing and then a three v two. And if they square up enough and, they, and they, they're accurate enough in their handling skills, you might be able to expose a bit of space here. Um, but again, that's looking for a perfect picture and that's not always possible. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, compare that to the last one, slight, slightly different, a bit more connected, um, mm -hmm. but still scope for improvement. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. Um, I actually really like the way the it's taken right to the line. It's, it's quite a late pass um, and that's... It's probably one of the more difficult skills to get that close to the defence. I mean, if you, again, if you're going to be critical, if you're going to think about it being even better, that, that's half a step early um, in, yeah. in terms of time of the pass. Placement outside is is probably probably slightly deeper than it might like to be. Um, you yeah. make that slightly flatter, you bring this slightly flatter, and I agree that that's, that's potentially a potentially four v three, four v two, even out on the on the on the outside. But uh, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on you know if you go back a little bit there again to. The, the, the pass from, from the forward um, with that supporting player if he could be an extra you know metre wider mm -hmm. would he be able to impact the second last defender as well by, by coming a bit sharper and maybe turning his hips a bit more as well um, mm -hmm. you know yeah. by being that close he's almost making it easy for the defender in front of him can he be an extra step wider to, to hit a, almost a 45 degree angle to bring that defender's mm -hmm. hips in second out yeah. and then you know, they're really in trouble um, but you know that again. It's just small things that I'm noticing when I'm watching this. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Nice thoughts. Yeah, I agree. A little bit more width would have, would have had a big old impact on that one. Uh, this next one got a got a different picture again. Yeah. So you know, Marcus Smith probably a bit closer, a bit a bit more connected. Um, but then the the pass itself from the forward to Marcus Smith is a little bit um, a little bit less accurate. However, he adjusts well. He he manages to catch the ball behind him. And then square off again to get the ball in space. Now at this point here, I'm probably thinking we're not going to get a lot out of this. We're, we're probably numbers even. Um, but the Quinn's winger here does fantastically well to stand his defender up one on one and create a little bit of a space um, to attack from in a three v two situation. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the final pass doesn't go to hand. Um, what I'd probably be saying here is at that point right there, um, you see that Marcus Smith is set up behind the first the first attacker, the first mm -hmm. forward, closest to scrum half. I think it's a really key point. If he starts moving as he does now, if he started any wider before, that pass would have been right in behind him and he'd have been mm -hmm. caught completely in route to pass that. So I think by starting closer, starting to the closest um, forward to the scrum half, you're then able to open up your view a bit more, able to see a bit more of a picture in front of you, and you're also able to run onto that ball with a bit of speed as the ball is passed. Mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's interesting uh, if you speak to any any tight end, loose head, hooker, second row even, uh, it's interesting that when you speak to them about how they feel when they get up and set piece. So they've just pushed to the scrum, they've maybe had two or three resets along the way, um, they talk about their level of fatigue at that point and then they're working really hard to get into position. 
what they don't want to be doing at this point is searching for the guy that they're passing to. So yeah. being being close, I'd say opens up the opens up the vision of the field. Fundamentally, yeah. it makes this pass so much easier. And even, yeah, even with it, you know, it's, it's challenging pass now. It's not accurate. It's a uh, it's, it's it's gone pretty high. Um, that pass is pretty tough when you've just pushed it scrum or driven a line out or worked it, worked up and down the field as a you know particularly as a front row forward. forward. I think you know for me as a, for me as a standoff as well. Something I've learned um, is the more information you can give those forwards in front of you, the more you can feed them in terms of the pictures they're seeing. Because as you said there, they're blown. They've just worked 50 meters across the pitch to get into that system. And if you can just feed them information of just catch and pass, catch and pass, or you know. I'm just on your right or on your left. It's you know, tighter, tighter, wide, whatever it's going to be. And um, just those small little bits of information will make a massive difference for those guys that are under fatigue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in your next clip, uh, we've got a slightly different context again. Uh, so we've got bah, pretty good connection, uh, nice defensive shape uh, as it as it stands currently. So just just talk us through what you're seeing. Yeah, I think uh, if you go back to the, the kind of the the first part there, just as, as the rock is is beginning to end and the, the nine still got the hands on the ball. You see just what we discussed a minute ago in terms of the Bristol spacing between the, the, the ball carrier and the ball player and the, the forward outside of that. He's probably got two, three metre space here. He's coming real hard at that at that down line which has engaged an extra defender which has forced this next defender to shoot out on 10 mm -hmm. and create a disconnect between those two guys. So as he started a bit wider, he's pulled an extra set of hips in has forced the next defender out to shoot, mm -hmm. uh, and that's allowed Shidi to take that space. Um, and what follows is probably my favourite clip of the season. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal piece of attack and play, you know, and creativity to think about this under so much pressure. Quality, quality, wonderful finish. And as you say, the some of the the small details that make the difference in, in this play. I mean. We talked with a, a close Marcus Watson could have been in certain situations, and actually Shady's right now is, is actually quite disconnected um, yeah, yeah. from from the shape. But actually looks fairly di fairly disinterested. Um, and I'm interested about the centre field. I mean, the, the inside shape, as you, as you allude to, we got uh, some good width from the from the third runner in in the pod. But then the centre field, the fact that they just add a little bit of movement really late on makes such a difference. And then uh, uh, just tiniest thing but the fact that Sheedy right now is looking outwards all of his body language says I am passing that ball out um, yeah. and the, I think the fact that he sells it so so well uh, the way his foot's placed right now is it was perfect for a side step isn't it but when yeah, you're absolutely. herring off the line and you think of an interception or you're thinking about the ball being passed and, and, and trying to get out and catch guys behind the game line you just don't see those things and th yeah, three goes, yeah. I think yeah. you know, we go back to the point I made before as well if, he, if he's started any wider um, from from his initial setup, so as he starts here, you can see he's probably just starting to shift in behind the ball carrier. The crossover is pretty pretty positive. If he start if he starts any closer to the opposite end of the pitch, that pass is going to go man and ball. He's not going to be able to see that guy flying because at this point you can see what's in front of him. You can see a kind of ninety degree angle. He can identify that guy flying. If he's any wider, then mm. that that flyer has got him, and he's not going to see that space. So yeah, that, that's really important. Um, yeah, it's definitely. such a small thing, but it, it's crucial in identifying space and just to open up your lens a bit a bit wider. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, where he is now, say he's got he's got the cover of the guy with the ball. If he then catches, he's then got protection of the of the second runner. If he's wider to start with, as you say, he's, he's, he's actually loses protection on both of those guys, and effectively just becomes a mispass, uh, yeah. which isn't hugely deceiving in, in this kind of this kind of context. Uh, and the, oh, the the presence of mind and the quality of the kick across. I'm a massive fan of a cross field at most most times of the week, but that's uh, that's yeah. definitely up there with the, with the ones from the season. And then yeah, one absolutely. that uh, you, you'll enjoy this one. Um, I, I know you you picked this one out with a with a lot of love in love in mind. Yeah, yeah, I um. I particularly love love this clip. Um, I don't want to hang any of my friends up to dry, but um, particularly good mates with uh, with Grant, number five here for Edinburgh. And, um, we've discussed this a couple of times in the past, but I think the, the the key here, the bit that we picked out really for the rugby detail, is that the impact that the, the ball player and the outside forward can have on manipulating defenders. Um, so Hastings does really, really well here to get his toes forward post-pass post and he 
he scanned for the space, he scanned for disconnect, and he managed just to pick the space that's been left. But I think if we take it back a little bit, um, I just see he's probably, what we've discussed in the, in the last couple of clips, he's probably a bit further across than we'd maybe like him to be. But you can see from his, his head movement that he's scanning for the space in front of him. Um, now, you could argue that it's 10 minutes to, to, to towards the end of the game. You could argue that the defence is fatigued. You could argue the attack is, is fatigued. But for some reason, this is a relatively narrow um, play. And it's still managed to pull defenders out through their body language and through the running line. So he's an early catch. Uh, the tight head has been pretty hard at the ball there. And mm -hmm. he's been, unfortunately, he's pulled out two Edinburgh defenders to allow that space to be created. And But Hastings attacking the ball at speed, he's been able to really attack that space he's been given to get his toes forward, to get his hips forward, post-pass. And then that space is then able to be exploited. Um, mm -hmm. But no, I, I think it just just highlights if we if you get your if you get your detail right within your attacking shape here, you you are able to exploit um, defenders if they're fatigued, especially and especially in the later the later stages of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, the it's it's almost an easy decision to commit inside, isn't it? And uh, to just go go hard at the line and go for it. I think that one of the things I'm I'm most impressed with with his things in behind is just how quickly he sees this space. I mean. Already, he knows that space is there. Before, before the, before he's even received the ball, he's looked in front. He spotted the opportunity. Um, I'm, I like the fact that he's just gone at the ball with absolute determination. I Means there's, there's no doubt there. He's taken that space, and and that's key to success, I think, in being being really clear in what you want to achieve. So it's a yeah, it's a, it's a good example of uh, of clarity in what, in what you want to achieve. Let's talk us through this next one. What you're seeing. Yeah, this one, um, this one will probably go against everything we've just said, um, but it's probably what what makes Finn Russell the, the player that he is. Um, this fascinated me when I watched it back. You know, if you look at Finn's engagement, you look at his positioning. Um, if you stop it there, he's just what we said. We maybe we don't want as much of. He's probably too far across the pitch. He's, he's almost aligned with the third forward, and um, so we've discussed him being behind the first or. Between the first and second, so look at his body language, his hands are at his side, but you can see that he's scanning, he's looking for the space, he's looking for in front of him. He's almost, and I'd argue, and I don't know this, um, I'd argue that he is deliberately looking like he is right now to paint a picture that he's not getting the ball. Um, mm -hmm. because you can see just as the, as, the, as the ball carry catches the ball, he sparks into life and he goes because he knows that he's 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 painting the picture, he's giving some cues to the defense. He ain't getting the ball, or he's not likely to get the ball. And in the minute he gets the chance to go, you pick him off, and he's done. Uh, I love yeah. this clip; it's, it's awesome. It's quality. I mean, it, it's again such a simple thing, but it, it is done so so well. And you look at the look at all the defenders and where they're looking. All eyes are either inwards at ruck or inwards of those inside runners. And this is the difference between being uh, not being animated. But knowing why, you, knowing that you're intentionally doing that. Uh, I think the, the clips we've shown so far, what we're essentially saying is, is being being animated for uh, for deception um, is is a, is pretty good behaviour. Um, it's almost even better if you show no animation. You show all the cues that you're definitely not getting the ball because you know that that in itself is deceiving, uh, and th and that's that's the really the big difference. I think that. It, it's, it's an awareness of, of what you're trying to achieve and why you're doing what you're doing rather than just kind of pointing in front because you want them to take contact and then they take contact. You, you're giving away all the answers. Um, so yeah, yeah. The, the lateness of the decision, just quality. And, and the, is even, even the pass then given at the line. Lovely to see. Just talk us through this one. This is, uh, this is probably worth uh, picking up a couple of points straight from the start. Yeah, so you see here, um, we've got Tulua. Tuala, sorry, Tuala, um, who, who gives their issue, initial offload. So if we roll it back to the start again there, you see um, Tuala is a player that, that passes the ball to Naira Boro in the, in the contact here. Uh, contact takes place. We then have the, our shape we've been talking about so far, the pause there of our, our, our play off nine. Um, so we've a bigger connected, probably slightly, slightly um, too far across the pitch, but again, he's connected, he's animated, and he's making the, the defender stay honest um, outside of the, the, the ball carrier here. 
that's allowed a, a pretty soft contact to be to be created, which allowed him to get over the game line. Um, and then he's then able, with that movement, as he's moving across the pitch, to then get into that next phase of attack at standoff. Um, so let this run through. Tag shape that the, the Frampton running with the first forward coming on that, on that down line. Um, but the bit that I, that I love the most about this is, if we roll it all the way back to the start again, it's Northampton's ability to create an extra man. So if we look at Tuala again here, as he makes this uh, awful to Naya Ravoro, but you see it again here, as he goes, he's looked to the right, not needed to be there, so he gets going. He's pushing out 12 now. If you pause it just as bigger gets the ball here, it'd be awesome. Um, so at this point here, we're, we're thinking that, you know, the, the connection is, is pretty positive in my mind. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Um, he's inside or, or just connected to the first forward. Maybe argue the uh, the forward should be a bit wider in, in their setup to, to maybe pull out that second last defender. Um, but as Bigger starts to move, he starts to move. He's allowed the 12 to push out. If he could square up a bit more here, potentially, he might be able to engage that third last defender. Uh, and the bit that we discussed is this forward coming off him here, you look at his body line, he's talking about cues. There is not a chance in hell he's getting that ball. He's almost beyond him before he's even caught the ball. So if you move it through a couple of couple of frames there, as far as catching the ball and he's gone. His hands are at his side and he gets past it in the face. It's a knock-on, it's a transition opportunity. And that allows Quinns to push off and actually create you know, a situation where the number's up. Um, so, yeah, if I could fix that again in hindsight, we, we, we are very lucky to sit here and look, look at it from an external point of view. Bring the Northampton forwards a bit wider, potentially manipulate that second-last defender a bit more. Mm -hmm. Ask Twala to square up a bit more and to really, really try and manipulate the second last defender, ask the forward and say to him to start a bit wider. If he can start on a five metre channel and come really, really hard mm -hmm. against the grain, that last guy has to make a decision. But right now, they're, they're, they're giving him very, very little to do in terms of defending the front line um, with their body language in the wide channel here. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some small contests in there with, with this, just this clip itself. Um, the, the three forwards coming off bigger. I'm, I'm actually really interested by their their position because when you look at the Quinn setter and you look yeah. at where their uh, where the individuals are. So from the ruck outwards, you've got uh, Sinclair, uh, and then, and then it looks like Rob Show outside, uh, and then there's there's a small breaking connection. Actually, those short lines. I mean, if if the ball was screened across me, even the third man from there, or bigger takes right to the line, it's actually a good opportunity for a, for a line break there, um, yeah. because they're so tight. And if, if they were if they were wider, they actually end up one on one. Right now, they could be kind of two and one in one of those those spaces, and an opportunity for, for an offload. But um, I suppose yeah. that that yeah. really, I mean, that that changes dependent on what the objective of the guy passing the ball is. And I, and I think that's an, such an important part of the game in general and in any attack plays is that bigger right now he has intention before he's got that ball in his hand. He, he has options. He's, he could hit, what, four, four players at this point. Um, however, I, I'm, I'm pretty strongly of the opinion right now that he, he knows he's got those options, but he has a fairly single intent um, as, to, as to where the balls go in. And if, they, if those guys do go what you did, it actually makes his job maybe slightly harder. Um, to, to get the ball out, so yeah. the way I, think, the... I, I, I can I can put agree, you know, and I, as you say, there's there's no right or wrong answer to that, and you know, I, I just had a thought there when we were discussing that. If you go back just to the previous when you got bigger catching the ball, my question would be here, you know, um, can the first first forward outside the bigger actually get the ball here? Um, if he could, would there be an option for him to actually hit him on that switch play and engage the thirteen there? Who's actually running? You know, he's running um, east-west across the pitch. Mm -hmm. If he started, to, to, if, if this first forward got the ball, mm -hmm. could he square off and thirteen try to expose the space between Sinclair and Robshaw? Um, because I've never, I've never actually seen. I mean, you might, you might be different. I've never actually seen or saw the standoff hit that first forward in this shape. Um, it's pretty rare. But, but you know. As, you know, similar to the way Bristol play that play off nine, where they'll, they'll hit the forward nine or loop and come back inside to the to the inside back. Um, that's a pretty similar option here. And there's a, mm -hmm. there's a as you say, there's a disconnect between three and one as well. Huge space between the inside sinker. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm just thinking out loud here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, no right no right or wrong answer. Spacing wise, as you say, you can hold up one defender. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wonder about the the you know the, the individual animation between the players. Are they all actually uh, the, the 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 Quins are just pushing off it, aren't they? Um, yeah, I mean, like with, with all those possibilities, I mean, the, the game is hugely complex, isn't it? And there's yeah. a lot, you've got a lot of decisions to try and make in one moment. Uh, you take all of that into account, and yet yeah, I think the thing that, if there's one thing that would have been different, it is, it's the, it is this one clip which you picked out, just one moment, just engaging the line a little bit more, a bit more animation outside, wider line ideally, uh, and this becomes a very different situation. It actually becomes yeah. quite easy to defend outside, so yeah. Complex game, uh, and yet it comes down yeah. to maybe maybe refining to actually what's the most important part so, of what you're looking at, because you can obviously get you can get lost with possibilities. Um, yeah. which, this is uh, <laughs> this this links in quite nicely to to that point. Um, so complex environment, loads of decisions to make, and it's interesting when you see players do things with absolute certainty versus being in doubt of what they're doing. Uh, so we've got a bit of Paul receiving the ball. I mean, what's he, what's he good at? Where, what are his strengths? Uh, he's really, really good at carrying the ball, really hard, and making ground for his team. Uh, and I, there's, there's no doubt right now that there's no other options. There, you've got Farrell, who's is potentially a pass, but that's not, it's just not happening. His body language says no. The guys outside are still reorganising, so that says no. So in terms of months of decision making, they've they've got less to think about, which you could argue uh, the attack are maybe not doing as well, but they're going to pull and running onto the ball. Um, and that in itself is enough to get you over game line with three tacklers and it's still able to get the game line. The influence that's then had is then cut down the defence a little. So now we've, we've got playoff 10 uh, and we've got, a, we've got a pretty different picture really. Um, so just just in terms of where threats are now, I mean, uh, if if you were defending this, where where would you be thinking? Where's the ball going? You, you, I suppose you're you're going to be caught between a, a few options, aren't you? You're probably thinking it's going at the back, um, mm-hmm. or you could be thinking it's that second forward. The the, the, the movement there together it, it, from all the Saracens players is pretty positive. So at this point right now, I'm thinking I'm not sure where the ball's going to go. If I was attacker, I'd want the ball to go to the to the edge here. Because the numbers we have, mm-hmm. um, you see a defender starting to kind of jockey almost on the outside, a uh, second last defender. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough That's decision cool. to make. Which I think is part of the success of it. So take it right back to the, the first phase. So play up, play off nine, uh, one in deception and movement. And sometimes it's about going back to the principles of the game. Like this is go forwards opportunity. Um, it also helps, helps uh, cut down the defence and take away some of the pressure the defensive to put on. Now, loads more animation, so lo- lots of movement at the back, good movement of cross, good two options of, of ball carriers. Carrying that wide now cuts down the defence again uh, and, and it just creates more opportunities. And uh, I just think that's, that's a, it's a pretty, cool, uh, pretty cool picture. Um, and then this one I thought was, was really interesting just because of some of the body language. Um, so we've got uh, Toje's arms out there. I mean, that you could argue on one side that that's add interception. He's got his arms up, um, but the way he's got his arms up, I'm, I'm not. I'm not convinced that that's a uh, that's a catchable situation. So this is ultra ultra critical, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easier, easier for us to say uh, that yeah. Um, but I'm thinking as, as he's going through that situation, how. How believable are your actions, and what influence that then have? So once they have them bought it, and they chase through, and if the tackle had stuck, uh, that that's the tackle behind the behind the gain line. Um, so just really small, really small detail, um, but just being really believable. It's, it's unlikely that he was going to be running if he was catching the ball with his arms fully extended out in front. And it, I just think that's had a, that's allowed the outside players to then. Sp- Quickly spot uh, and just get straight through. Um, I suppose I maybe something inside. in that as well, you know, around, around the scrum half, you know, um, his body language, I completely agree. Um, it ha- has the scrum half actually looked at these guys before he's made the pass? Because you look at the impact of the, once the defence has shifted off pretty quickly, um, you know, has it been, I don't know if, you, if you're able to maybe take an extra step and know that'll impact the, the speed of the defensive line, but. Yeah, I don't know how much uh, how much deception has been from the ninth. Actually, even considering these guys, 
uh, as an option. I don't know your mm -hmm. thoughts are on that. No, I think it's a good point. Um, obviously, Wigglesworth here is his eyes are firmly fixed in, in behind. Um, ironically, uh, even with even knowing where he's passing, the, the pass ends up uh, ends up fairly high. Um, but the yeah, I, I agree. His his eyes and body language are all saying uh, the ball's going in behind. It's it's just far too easy. I mean, it's interesting. The Munster defence can't ignore that pod, and I think that's an important point to make. Although the you know, the pod doesn't look particularly believable. And Wiggleworth's Wiggleworth language isn't all that believable. They still can't ignore it, uh, and that's that's one of the benefits of the uh, of the pods, I suppose, is that they you, know, you have you have these options, and uh, I mean, so, some of the options we look at uh, in a moment, we'll we'll pick up on on some of that. Um, so diff different context again. Uh, this is uh, Exeter um, in, in attack. Just tell me, just tell me what you're seeing. Just uh, go back to that. Play again. What type of things are you picking up? Yeah, we spoke about um, you know are Exeter caught in between two minds here? Are are they looking to stand static and distribute um, from from deep? But are they looking to take the ball on and all move together in motion? My my initial thought is here: if they're going to stand, you know, seven meters behind scrum half, they've got to start moving um mm -hmm. because straight away what we're given the the bristol defense off a touch line there's only really one type of defense here because there's nobody in the opposite there's nobody on the short side for, for exit or therefore the only threat they have is is open here mm -hmm. if you're going to take that ball so deep and argue that you'd probably have to start moving forward onto the ball and having all four of those players moving together and mm -hmm. um, if you are going to stand static then you'd probably have to start three or four meters forward and force your skills under pressure to to negate that fly and line speed from, from the Bristol defence. Um, in terms of connections, uh, you know, 10 is relatively connected, but, you know, would, would you argue that the, the outside forward there is animated? Probably not. He's standing upright. Um, I think it's a huge part. Can, can we get these guys, can we get these three forwards, um, all the outside, foot, outside hand forward, all animated, all with their body tilting over the ball to actually look like they're going to carry the ball regardless they're going to pass a track? Mm -hmm. Can we force these guys to catch and pass in that position to really manipulate defenders? Because right now, I think it's Kasevich in the, in the inside, and I'm not sure the outside attacker is there. Both of those guys are very, very upright. The only way that ball is going is in behind. So for me, the cues there are, you know, let's, let's get going, let's get flying. Um, can you look at a pass there? You know, there's, at that point where the pa pass is made, you know, there's, there's not a lot of chance that ball is going to go too forward. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's probably that's what I'm seeing there. Do you see anything different? Yeah, I'm I'm really interested by it, and I uh, suppose part of what I'm I'm thinking here is that every team has their own way and their own strategies and the things that suit them. Uh, and w when I see this from Exeter, I think this is actually quite typical of a lot of the way that they uh, they like to attack is that they, they actually do quite a lot behind behind game line. Um, a part of it is trying to unsettle a defence, but I can't help but think that this would be even better. If they were animated either side, uh, and there was some good body damage there, um, I think uh, in terms of possibility, I mean the defence are clearly engaged on the ball, so they they clearly bought that he's going to carry, uh, and certainly can can ignore him or they put enough pressure onto the pass. I think the key bit really is the fact that although there's pressure going on ball carrier because there's nothing outside, this next contact is caused because of that. So this this tackle. I don't, it, it doesn't happen if if the outside player is animated and is running running from maybe a decent angle, um, definitely better depth. This next contact doesn't happen, um, and this is where shapes are, are, I think have their both their success and their failure. Is a they Exeter have essentially just lost three players uh, in yeah. in that part of the field, and they've not actually gained anything because they've still yeah. you've still ended up with a, a three man press. Two of them are taken on the inside, but the other one's gone. So Bristol actually end up in a better position as a result of this, and then even make the next hack be in the game line and have an opportunity to reset the defence, having made kind of four meters without, without doing a great deal of work. So yeah, if you go back to that again, um, just the, the the starting point of the play. So here you can that's a relatively big disconnect between Lua two and inside defender. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of putting together what we said before. If 10 could have started inside Kasevich, would you be able to argue that he'd have seen that space a bit easier? Would you be able to argue that if the outside attacker, as you said, starts two or three feet wider and then really gets 
the opposite shoulder of the defender and say, oh, the two are, that space is huge. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, but, this play is designed for it, isn't it? I mean, this play, yeah. th those kind of holes and those kind of gaps, it's made for. So uh, if you if the behaviour is intentionally deceiving, which I don't think it is, but if the defend yeah. if the behaviour is intentionally deceiving, this play is, this comes off. Uh, ball in behind, turn the corner really sharp, uh, and, and get through that space because as they lose who outside he's he's not he's not interested in anything inside um and even i mean even if that space does then close you still got another space open then inside of halithaka i mean there's still there's still new opportunities for those extra plays uh, to, to get through so yeah yes sim similar themes i suppose where we're picking up there again it's easy you know it's easier for us to watch this and say that's right or that's wrong but obviously there's, there's a context against it but I just think yeah just little things you can pick out um, it's, it's fascinating to watch yeah. yeah and this is a this is a slightly different a different I suppose picture um, in that actually I look at that and I think that that's actually that looks pretty good we've got a two active guys outside the ball we've got a player in behind who's really active uh, and still it ends up with being shut down and what does that come down to that comes down to defenders pre-reading what those possibilities are and I actually love the fact that this is an outside shoulder press uh, we've got a real aggression to just get in the eye line a little um, and oh, there's a disconnect inside for Munster I mean the, there's this space there and you could argue that they're stepping into air spaces um, but with the covering Munster defence it's, it's worked really in, the, in their favour so um, yeah, just thought it was a thought it was an interesting clip that, uh, that demonstrates that even sometimes you know look at training park and you think actually that looks really good in the training park. Well, does that look really good and does it work really well against this kind of defence? Um, and just how important it is when you're practicing that you don't you don't constantly show the same pictures defensively. Um, get in the right line a little bit. I mean, that ball's not going outside. I mean, look at looking on body language outside. It's it's highly unlikely the ball's going out. We got. Well, four players in the contact area. We've got th uh, three lengths of the players left side. So in terms of numbers, it's highly unlikely that lengths are going to play with any width, um, which kind of increases maybe the confidence of the ones that play is the press. Uh, but yeah, I just I just think that when, when we're practicing, we can be really mindful of giving players these opportunities to adapt and, and, and find ways to, to solve those kind of problems. Yeah. Uh, and this, I mean, I, there's there's lots of lots of highlights uh, in a rugby season. I just absolutely love this play. I mean, it, it's it's probably my favourite little bit of attack of the of the entire season. Uh, probably need to get out more. <laughs> nah. it's it's just gonna, this time's for me. Just going to show you that again. Uh, so, got, so Sexton at uh, first receiver. Uh, he's got Van der Fleer then as his short option. I just just look at the timing of the, of the pass, which I think is where the success is. And just before he's passing. The fact that right now his eyes are on Van der Fleer, uh, his, his hands are in, in a passive position, that means he could pass it behind or pass, pass flat, and that's what actually means he gets whacked. So he, he's, he's properly gone to the line, he's taken a big old hit from the second row, uh, and a, a part of the success of the play is that he's been that convincing with everything that he's done. So simplest of simple plays, hip square right now, I mean look look what his head is right now, looking out looking out of the space in front, he's telling those he's telling those uh, the outside defenders, telling bigger that like, you you're gonna have to deal with me. You can't you can't just ignore me. Um Van der Fleer even on the outside, uh, I mean it, it could be probably a little bit critical of Van der Fleer where it, where his head is now. If, if his head is is inwards he's, he's probably a little bit more convincing. Um he's, he's more concerned about where the defenders are which of course, you wouldn't be if you're receiving the, the the ball in in that moment. So maybe maybe a small adaption there, but I mean he's running an incredibly effective line. He's still taking bigger out, uh, gives him a little uh, little nudge on the way through, um, and it's it's actually defended really well by by Saints and, and get to, get at the edge. But just in terms of game line and, and you know, principles of play, go forwards. Um, start on the ten, on the ten meter line. Really simple play, not a, not a huge amount of, of space to work with. But just really believable, run really hard, and they and they're able to make ten meters without without too much stress, and, and they've got that wonderful go forwards and, and in the touchline shape now. So it's kind of set up their play. Um, anything uh, anything extra you're you're seeing from this? No, I mean uh, again, if we're if we're asking to paint a, per a perfect picture, which you know is never always or is we're never achievable at all points. Um, could Henshaw be slightly closer to? To um, the inside of Sexton to hide himself a bit longer potentially, 
Um, yeah, as you said before, Chris Van der Fleer a bit, a bit wider, but yeah, I mean, it's the section going straight to the line is great. Does he turn his hips a bit late, open up the ribs potentially for a, for a big shot? I, I don't know. It's a bloody tough, uh, tough place to be as a standoff. <laughs> yeah. A guy that is, yeah, he's, oh, he's putting himself right in the line. I agree with Henshaw. Yeah, yeah, definitely... Especially when people are targeting him the way they do. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's great. You know, and as you say, it's just that it's a building block towards that next phase. You've got 10 metres down the edge. You've, you've, you've bent him a bit there. So, um, yeah. yeah, great. Yes, yeah, I suppose building a little bit off uh, the Finn Russell example and some of the deception you can show. I mean, it'd be in, interesting if this, if this was flipped. So, Van der Free is really animated. Henshaw looks like he's not getting the ball, looks disinterested. Um, and then the impact that might have in the defence. Um, yeah, so yeah just, absolutely. Let's be fair, Sexton, before he's received the ball, he knows where he wants to pass that ball. His, his intention is, is quite clear that he's going to look for an out, out the back. Um, so can you then flip your body language and, and show all, all the opposites to what you actually want to achieve, which uh, I think is, uh, you know, then, so let's be fair, they're pretty good. Uh, they're pretty successful. Um, just yeah, I wonder with... Uh, no with my, with my own team, the kind of uh, uh, my, my own club and school teams, I wonder uh, with those players. I mean, kind of get them to really think about how they how they like to opposition and and, sh- and show them different pictures. I think it's getting away from that that kind of old school terminology around dummy lines. You know, and, you know, there's no such thing as a dummy line. If you like, it's about trying to educate, especially in our context, under 18s, is trying to educate the boys on the importance of of running lines and and, and the, the impact they can have in terms of the the manipulation of defenders. Um, I think once you get them excited about that and you can, you can show them how their hips and their eyes can influence people, then they're starting to have a real meaning behind it and it, it becomes more than just a dummy line. Um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest bugbears in, in, in coaching. And I've certainly been guilty of it in the past, you know, as a, as a younger coach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a different context again. So uh, we got uh, Saints against Costa this was a fantastic game um, some some quality play from this this was interesting because it's a line break uh, so they got some really good go forwards and they just had a little movement fr- from the line break I mean there's no movement out the back of it necessarily um, you, could, you could argue Laws kind of becomes an out the back option but it's, only, it's, it's one player essentially running towards contact with Laws then cross, crossing over uh, and even that is effective enough to get Two or three meters, and that's just how important context is to to any kind of judgment of uh, of what you see in and where body language is. Like context wise, they've broken the line. Uh, Gloucester are working really hard to get back, um, and right now it's about to, can, can we get the ball to space? And, and where is the space right now? Well, there's some really good spaces in between those players, um, and you know you, you put in laws now against a backline player. Um, that in itself, you could, if, depending on your perspective, you could argue that is a space. Uh, it's a body, but it's a body that is very different to, to Laws. And the fact that he's able now to get some uh, get some go forwards, I mean, that's that's two or three metres without, without doing much. Um, and then this one, kind of similar similar kind of context, really. So uh, this one is uh, fairly structured play. Um, bigger right now, doesn't want the ball. Uh, clearly doesn't want the ball. Uh, hands are still by your sides. This isn't a Finn Russell example. This is a, I definitely don't want the ball. Um, forwards carry, defence covered it really easily. But then you think, well, well, why was that? Why did Bigger not want the uh, want the ball? And you look at the outside of Saint Setter, and you start to see the picture. So they're flattening up. They've got some little bit of go forwards. They've got decent shape, and then they kick for pressure. Um, and the kick, you know, it's a cracking kick, put loads and loads of pressure on uh, in the right area of the field. So sometimes uh, it's not it's, it's not always about just that individual phase. I mean, if you if you look at that as a snapshot, we could be it'd be easy to be critical. Like we, we could, everything we've said so far, but in this context, I actually don't think it applies. In, in this context, it's uh, the, the the aim right now is to set a platform, create an opportunity where the defence are mixed backs and forwards uh, within the defensive line. They brought the wing uh, brought the winger into a, an outside space where they know they've got a, a single man covering the backfield on the on the on the left side. Um, an opportunity to kick. What what, what are you seeing? No, I completely agree. You see, you see him coming to life, you know, once that first phase is panned out, you can see that he's he's been thinking about this this two, three phase um process in his head and once that's happened, he's ticked it off, the next thing he then his body language starts to change. So mm-hmm. no, I agree. I think you're right, that's the point you've made. Everything we're saying here is is looking back on hindsight. We we haven't considered the, the five, six phases before that, the score mm-hmm. line, the time of the game. It's just Looking at the, the detail in isolation, um, but yeah, I can completely agree. 
Um, I was taking uh, taking context in, into space. I mean, you look at it, these kind of these kind of moments are just just so important. Uh, the the awareness of players off the ball. Um, so context is incredibly important. Uh, Saudis have been breaking the line in, in this particular game. You know, with fairly regularly, but they're under pressure. You know, we still have played some good rugby up, up until this point in the game, and they're putting Saudis under under loads of pressure. Um, and they're just I just really love the way that this late bit of deception just gives Jamie Jaws through. And the fact that the offload comes, you know, that, that for me, when, it, when people talk about shape and its predictability and so on, well, for me, part of the benefit of having an awareness of shape here is that they have that option. That when George gets the ball, this moment, he knows he has an outside runner. And how does he know he's there? Because it's the, it's the shape that they've been standing in for you know, hours on end in, in practice. Uh, it's a, it's actually quite a dis, uh, a disorganised shape intentionally. Um, I, I actually really love the fact that Barrett just kind of pops up and then drops back, so it gives an extra option. You've got Faro trailing as well, so there's loads of possibilities around it. Um, but in in simple terms, break the line, give an offload because you know the guy's there, uh, and that that's giving him an extra few meters. What are your what are your thoughts? What are your what are your points? Uh, no, absolutely. You, again, you, we we went back to before about. Everyone moving in motion, everyone moving together. Um, that that second off would wouldn't have came if Six wasn't still moving forward, if he still wasn't fighting through the contact. You see Pierre Tiger sort of grabbing him. It's easy to stop there, it's easy to, to be affected by that, but he fights through into space. Um and it that's been you know the origin of that is that he's moved together with the passer. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, and even you know, even right at the end of it, you've got Barrett who's reacted. Straight in potential offload, but he's immediately over the ball, um, just kind of prevents it, uh, a contest coming. And then uh, last couple of clips. Um, this is uh, this again based on context. You got uh, Osprey Scarlets from uh, Christmas time. Um, so the the game game itself, Scarlets had a had a pretty pretty good way with the, with the game. Um, and this is this for me is uh, is a situation where you think, well, how do you make life difficult for your opposition? So. Currently, Scarlett's got 15 players on feet. Um, I mean, we can see what's happening from, just from this moment, just from that one snapshot. You, you can see what, what's, what's coming uh, up next. And I just wonder, when you go through those kind of plays, Scarlett's now 14 men on feet. They haven't contested the ruck. They haven't put any numbers in. Uh, you've got guys starting to, starting to think about maybe what, what's coming next. Think about how many Ospreys players are in there. Um, so while Ospreys might not go and attack with it when they're 22 right now, I just wonder what what could they do within this play to to draw in some extra defenders. So the guys off the ball, what what are they what are they thinking right now? They've gone straight straight to the ball. So you've got what, four Ospreys players in that area at the scrum half. There's there's five Ospreys players in 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 that area. Um, which when you think about then your kick chase, you're you're actually underpowered all the time. You put five players in. Scarlett's got one. They've organised their backfield. Um, so just look at this setup, and I wonder where's the opportunity here for a bit more, a bit more want to go forwards rather than to just set, um, because set is actually working in the opposition's favour. So what, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, okay, we'll get through to the the, the outcome of this in a minute, but yeah, my argument here is: are are they now ready to kick? Or are they are they kicking now because they've planned to kick? Um, you look at the numbers in that breakdown. Do they need six guys in there if it played us through? When we go back to this this um, this phase, are they are they kicking here because they plan to kick in the first couple of minutes in a certain or the first twenty minutes in a certain way? Mm-hmm. Um, do they need to be a bit more, a bit more, a bit more patient in, in terms of actually building a platform to kick from? Mm-hmm. Um, because as you as you roll through in a minute, you see the, the impact of this. Um, this previous phase, in terms of the numbers they've got on the ground and their organisation around it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. well, yeah, this is uh, this is the the kick that then comes from. So they they, they kick the ball. Uh, it then ends up to Scarlett. So we get a little bit of a uh, little bit of unstructured, um, and then the influence. So if you go if you go back to the uh, go back to the previous bit. So this is uh, this is the just before the kick. The numbers of that ruck. Uh, the organisation Scarlett are able, able to, to get and um, pre-plan. The ball is then kicked uh, and we end up kind of 20, 20 seconds later um, and know what the picture that leaves. So we're able to, 
just get the ball away and why are they so eager because they can see the space that's, that's available so just being just being able to uh, not be put under any pressure in those situations means that when you do then get the ball you've actually you're fairly fairly pre-planned in what, what you think you're going to do um and just the desperation of the of the scarlet spot he's just to get the ball away you know ken, ken owens getting, getting the ball away they're already in shape outside uh, yeah. but not quite ready to pull the trigger yet so just just carry but still wanting to to keep the ball going ball moving yeah I think it's that you know it's that race the race between the attack and defense and transition to be organized first and you think Look at that picture there. The the picture between the the, the Scarlet's attack but the, the Ospreys' defence is uh, it almost mirrors each other. There's almost two lines of defence there for for the Ospreys. Yeah, you know, um, at that point there, there's, there's you know you've got a couple of, couple of disconnects and the picture never ends. And the, the, the Scarlet's attack is the same, but they actually they've, they've got the ball. Um, so it's yeah. that you know it's that work to get behind the ball and win the race to be organised. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, when you, when, you, when you go back to this, uh, you then you then think, well, uh, right now, how were you influencing your opposition? So uh, the Ospreys are clearly planning to, to kick, and the kick is not not the issue. I don't I don't think it's the it's how were they Im- impacting their opposition, and then when they have kicked the ball away, what that th- what picture that then leaves? So you you've given the opposition possession, you've now got a situation where you've got to try and shut them down. But the opposition had so much time to plan and prepare and to organise themselves that they, they actually they know where the space is right now. Um, and just a minor detail there, just having hands up. So uh, hands up in the, in, the, in attack just make, makes a bit of difference. Uh, just engages uh, engages defenders for that extra second. And then at the end of it all, you know, Steph Evans is, is sliding pre receipt yeah, which I just absolutely is awareness right now of where the space is. Slides pre receipt and ends on right into the space. So kind of a, a side step in possession is a is always a nice thing to see. Um, but sometimes just this side of knowing the awareness before receiving the ball can create you so much more time. Um, so yeah, a lo- lovely bit of play just to, to finish him off. Awesome. Ken Owens two two passes from nine as well. Awesome from a hooker. Hey, who would have thought that? Who would have thought that? Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully the listeners, some viewers will uh, will benefit a little bit from our discussion. I've uh, I've definitely benefited from it. It was uh, it was really nice just to, just to talk rugby and in, uh, in in some in some good detail. Um, and hopefully we're going to do it again sometime. So yeah, thank thank you for your time. Absolutely, thank you for having me, mate. It's um, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm really grateful to be on. I, I love your content online. So uh, yeah, keep up the good work. It's it's awesome. Um, keeping us going through lockdown. So. Thanks for listening to episode one of the Rugby Analysis Deep Dive. If you enjoyed what you saw, please do hit the subscribe button. There's loads more to come in the coming weeks and loads through the channel. See you soon.